Hello friends and welcome to this channel. My name is Nonye and I am your real estate tutoress. On this channel, I bring you the best tips and tools to getting your real estate license. I also answer any questions you may have about the process. If you're new here, welcome and do consider subscribing. In today's video, we're gonna be going over some practice questions together. Now I got the questions from the Modern Real Estate Practice in Illinois book. It's the yellow and black one that has the city on it, the 10th edition one. So at the end of the book, there are some practice questions. There are three practice questions, 150 questions in total. So 150 times three. So that's a lot of practice questions for you. Now, why I'm doing this is because I don't want to just pick questions from one topic because on the exam, all the questions are going to be mixed in together. You're not going to be doing chapter one questions and then chapter two questions. It's just all a blend. So it's good to know as you're going through and doing practice questions, when you get a question, you're going to be like, okay, this is from the lean chapter. When you get another question, you're like, okay, this is from the police power section, or this is from financing. And then your brain just has to adjust to answer the question accordingly. So I have 10 questions that I prepared. I haven't answered all of them. I just typed them up and I found the answers and marked them down. So we're gonna go through together and hopefully I get them right or not. That's okay. You don't need a hundred percent to pass the exam anyway. All right. So hopefully when I do that and you see my process, it will help you as you prepare. Now, a few things. Never overthink a question. Don't add things to the question. If you're not sure, um, bookmark the question, move on to the next one and then come back to it. Now, I am an instructor, so I know the material. So it might seem easier for me. But the more you prepare, the easier it's going to become for you as well. All right, so without further ado, let's jump into the questions. Question number one. The, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 prohibited discrimination based on... The Fair Housing Act of 1968 prohibited discrimination based on... Now, here's another tip, actually, before we continue. As the questions come up, you can pause, try to solve it, and then continue playing to see if you got it right. All right, what are our options? Familial status, sexual orientation, race, and then public assistance income. Fair Housing Act of 1968. So you're gonna be thinking in your brain when you study this stuff, what were the first ones from 1968, all right? Familial status came later in 1988, so that's not it. Sexual orientation is new. For on the federal level, your state, Illinois, has had it for a while, but it's new on the federal level. So that was not from 1968. Race, race was included in 1866. So that's a potential one. So let's keep race. And then finally, public assistance income. That's also fairly new. So based off of what we just did, the only thing that makes sense is race. And that's what you would pick. Next question. What is the difference between a general lien and a specific lien? A general lien cannot be enforced in court while a specific lien can. A specific lien is held by only one person while a general lien must be held by two or more people. A general lien is a lien against personal property while a specific lien is a lien against real estate. And D, a specific lien is a lien against a certain parcel of real estate while a general lien covers all of the debtor's property. All right. So think about those two phrases, specific lien, general lien. So the word specific means it's targeting one thing. The word general, a lot of things. So based on that alone, what's your answer? D as in dog. Okay. So remember specific lien, specific to the property or one property, general covers multiple things, all of your debts. And so our answer to this would be D. Next question. A sponsoring broker enters into a listing agreement with the seller in which the seller will receive $120,000 from the sale of a vacant lot. And the sponsoring broker will receive any sale proceeds 
exceeding that amount. This is what type of listing. Okay. So looking at our options, exclusive agency, net, exclusive right to sell, multiple. Which one would you pick? All right. So based on the way it's set up, the broker is going to get the proceeds after the seller gets 120. So the broker is going to net the difference. Okay. And our answer is this, All right? In the net listing, we don't essentially know how much we're going to make. We just know that we're going to make whatever is in excess of what the seller takes home or the seller is net. All right. So this is a net listing. With the exclusive agency and exclusive right to sell, the agent gets paid whatever they negotiate up front. And it doesn't depend on the seller's net. Next question. A buyer has an 80-20 LTV and a $5,000 earnest money deposit, which would be used at closing to cover part of the down payment. If the purchase price of the home is $250,000, how much additional funds must the buyer bring to complete the down payment? All right, so a couple of things here. And remember on the exam, you get scratch paper. So make sure you have scratch paper when you're doing math. All right. LTV is 80-20, meaning they're going to get 80% as a loan, and then they're going to put a 20% down payment on that home. They already paid $5,000, so we need 20% of 250000 All right, $250K. All right, grab your calculator and do the math. Okay, so 250,000 times 20%, and that should give you $50,000. Okay, so 50,000. So then we go back to the question and just make sure, because if you look there, you see $50,000 is one of the options, but we need to make sure that we've completely answered the question and solved everything that needs to be solved. So it says in the question, the buyer has already put down 5,000, which will count towards their down payment. So we need to subtract the 5,000 from our 50, okay? And that's gonna give us $45,000. So hopefully you paused and you tried to solve this on your own and you got the right answer. If not, you can see what I did here and you can use that to prepare, okay? Know how to, determine LTV. So if you see this number, remember LTV loan to value. So the loan is 20, 80% and the buyer is going to put 80% down. Next, a real estate licensee does not show non-Asian clients any properties in several traditionally Asian neighborhoods. She bases this practice on the need to preserve the valuable cultural integrity of Asian immigrant communities. Which of these statements is true? Now, before we look at the statements, all right, after reading through that, is the agent right or is the agent wrong? Are they violating any laws by doing this? So that's the first question that's going to come through your, to your to your mind. From reading this, the agent is wrong because it's saying that the agent is not showing certain clients a particular neighborhood intentionally. All right. So now let's go to the comment, the options. The licensee's policy is steering and violates the fair housing laws regardless of her motivation. That sounds like the answer to me, but let's read the other ones just to make sure. All right, so let's keep A in mind. Because the licensee is not attempting to restrict the rights of any single minority group, the practice does not constitute steering. Okay, so now what is steering? Steering is guiding people in, in a certain direction or guiding them away from a certain neighborhood. So is the agent doing that? Yes. So B is not the right answer. C. 
The licensee's policy is steering, but it does not violate fair housing laws because she is motivated by cultural preservation, not by exclusion or discrimination. Now, C sounds very good, but the reason is wrong. Okay, steering violates fair housing regardless of your intention. The buyer should choose where they want to live. It's not up to you, the agent, to direct them where they should live. Even if they ask you, all right, on the exam, even if they ask you, do not direct them towards a certain neighborhood or away from a certain neighborhood. They should tell you where they want to live, and then that's where you point them to. And then D, the licensee's policy has the effect, but not the intent of steering. That's correct. Actually, you know, it's, it's not correct. Okay. So the answer is A. D is not correct. So you can see how like C and D are kind of confusing. But if you understand what steering is, don't, don't fall for any of those things. Just know that, okay, steering is this. This is wrong. Pick A. Move on to the next thing. Next question. The real estate broker specializes in helping both buyers and sellers fill in the blanks and negotiate the terms of the contract. Because the broker is an agent of both parties, he may not disclose either party's confidential information to the other. The broker is acting as buyer's agent, seller's agent, transactional broker, or dual agent. Now, this one should be easy, guys. They're acting for both the buyer and the seller in the transaction. Therefore, they are a dual agent. Okay. They are a dual agent. All right. And remember, in Illinois, dual agency is legal as long as it is disclosed in writing to all parties. Next question, a buyer makes an offer on a property and the seller accepts. Three weeks later, the buyer announces that the deal's off and refuses to go through with the sale. If the seller is entitled to keep the buyer's earnest money deposit, it is most likely because the sales contract contains A, a liquidated damages clause, B, a contingent damages clause, C, an actual damages clause, and D, a revocation clause. If you remember um, your contract chapter, there's really nothing like a revocation clause that we that's common in our contracts. There might be something legally, but we didn't really talk about it. An actual damages clause as well, we didn't talk about that. Contingent damages, we really didn't talk about it. There is a contingency clause, but there isn't contingency damages. So the answer really is liquidated damages. With liquidated damages, we're saying that, and it's going to be stipulated in the contract, if the buyer should default, then their earnest money will cover the damages that the seller has suffered because the buyer defaulted on that contract. Okay, And if you notice, the question said, most likely. Okay, Most likely. We don't know for sure. We don't have 100% confirmation from the question. And that's why it says most likely. So when you get most likely questions, just pick the one that seems best to you and move forward. All right. Next question. If a house was sold for $140,000 and the buyer obtained an FHA insured mortgage loan for $133,700, how much money would the buyer pay in discount points if the lender charged two discount points okay so the house is worth 140 they got a loan for 133.7 two discount points how much is discount points so think about discount points from your financing chapter how do we calculate discount points we calculate discount points on the loan amount so this is an act this is actually an easier question because you don't have to figure out the loan amount they give you the loan amount the fact that it's an FHA loan has nothing to do with this question. Okay. So two discount points is also 2% of the loan amount. 
So you would grab your calculator and figure out 2% of 133700. And when I did that, I got B as in boy. I hope you got the same thing. So 2% is two discount points. And then we're calculating it on the loan amount, not on the purchase price. All right. So sometimes when you get a question like this, they may give you the purchase price and then give you the LTV. Remember, we did an LTV question earlier. So they may say um, the buyer is putting down three, uh, 10%. So then you have to figure out what the loan amount is if they're putting down 10%. When you find that loan amount, then you calculate your discount points on that loan amount. Next question. A grandmother grants a life estate to her grandson and stipulates that on the grandson's death, the title to the property will pass to her son-in-law. The second estate is called remainder, reversion, estate as sufferance, estate for years. So the grandmother gives the property to her grandson and says if the grandson passes away, it goes to the, the son-in-law, so probably his father, right? What position does that son-in-law have? Okay, so the son-in-law is not an estate for years because this is a type of tenancy, not an estate for sufferance. That's a type of tenancy. We're between A and B. Reversion is going back. Remainder is who's left over. So if the son dies, it goes to the grand, the son-in-law. So that's the remainder. All right. So if you don't remember this, look in the chapter on um, freehold estates. And a life estate is one of them. So you have the remainder and then reversion. If the question said... When the grandson dies, the property goes back to the mother. That's a reversion. It's going back to the original owner. But if it's going to someone else other than the original owner, it's a remainder. All right? Last question. A borrower takes out a mortgage loan that requires monthly payments of $875.70 for 20 years and a final payment of 24,095. What type of loan is this? All right, true story. As I was reading that, I thought it was a math question. I was like, oh crap, I didn't practice this. So I don't know what I'm gonna do. But as you can see, it's not actually a math question. So you may see numbers and it's not a math calculation. So they're making monthly payments for 20 years. And then at the end, they have to pay a bigger chunk right? What type of loan is this? Do you remember what type of loan this is? All right. It is a balloon loan. All right. So for this question, you need to know the vocabulary because if you don't know what any of this means, I guess you could think about it, but if you don't know, you don't know. Um, how I remember balloon payments is I'm, I'm making small payments and at the end I have this big thing that we have to pop. And so that's how I remember balloon type loans so with that we've come to the end of this video hope it was beneficial to you and hope you were able to learn from this and tell me how you did in the comments how you did through this hopefully you were pausing and then solving and then going forward with it so let me know how you did and be sure to come back for additional um, videos check out my older ones and if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'll also leave in the description a link to um, a way that you can book like a 15-minute consultation with me if you have questions as you're preparing for the exam. Um, I do offer some private tutoring right, when I can. So there are options there too. So feel free to do that. And then get the planner. Um, in the planner, I included how to use the planner. So there are ways that, you know, you can make that beneficial to you as you're going through this process. Print off as many pages as you need and put them in a binder or something to help you. All right. Thank you so much for watching. If you haven't subscribed already, please do so and help me grow this channel. Share videos with your friends and I will see you in the next video.